Uh, all right, guys. Uh, this is actually kind of uh, actually by request. That lamp looks weird. I'm trying to get some better lighting in here. I'm in my back room and I've started a new shelf, like behind us over there. You know, I had to build it and nail it and got it for cheap because it fell apart. And there's actually three rows of comic books. That lamp is going to do terrible things. And uh, I figure. I've actually been asked about some of my shelves, and I know they're pertaining to the ones in the living room that are in the background of uh, most of my videos, but I'm boxing some of that stuff and rearranging things, so I figure before I start messing with these, we'll uh, go through some of these, and um, this might be in parts, or might be one shot, let's see how it goes, because of course, you know, I talk, and I feel like I'm doing like a really bad clip show from like some, you know, early 80s TV show like Happy Days with Laverne and Shirley, because a lot of this stuff I've had for years, I've talked about, or as I bought it, I showed, you know, showed it in a video already, but, you know, after three years of videos, I know, you know, people just don't live and breathe to watch my stuff, but anyway, let's go ahead and get to it here. Uh, first thing on the shelf here, this is like mostly trade paperbacks and graphic novels, uh, get a good look there, and uh, first thing, you know, I've had this for a couple years, it's a mouse guard by Dave Peterson, and I met Dave Peterson, and, uh, he uh, actually did something very cool in this once. Um, when I met him, I told him about how his Howler Mouse showed him the uh, shirt I had that a fan had sent. Then he drew a Howling Mouse in there and signed the book, which was very cool. So up here, uh, I've got a guide to action figures. Um, you know, used to collect those a whole lot more than I did. Um, some more uh, mouse guard stuff signed by Dave Peterson up here at the top. Okay, you know he signed all of this. I took it down to a comic book convention over the summer, and uh, a lot of this stuff is just you know just a whole lot of stuff. Um, I got number one in here signed by Dave Peterson, but you know a lot of the original first print editions of Mouse Guard when it came out. He signed everything that I had by him. Real nice guy. And here it is, here's the first print, first appearance of Mouse Guard signed by David Peterson, which I'm pretty proud of. Set that right there. This is going to be a little awkward, so I apologize. Um, of course, I had to get this. This was the TV Guide Comic Con special. Talked about TV shows and movies and interviews and whatnot uh, throughout the whole thing. Took me a while to catch on to True Blood. When I was seeing this stuff, I was like, come on, and I started watching it. Uh, you know, it's got interviews about shows, uh, Fringe and Big Bang Theory and stuff. The one that came out. It was one of four covers, so I, I got the Big Bang cover. I got my Rock and Roll Trivia of Rolling Stones. You have to have that. And it really amazed me how much I was able to answer in there. And then I got my box set of Ramones, which has uh, a comic book inside of it. And, uh, oh, the comic book's already out. So, uh, you know, it's got a bunch of indie people in there. Weird Tales of the Ramones and Romance. Like a romance cover of the Ramones. And a bunch of short stories and it has some 3D stuff. Alright, and there's some assorted stuff, but we'll, we'll stick to this over here. Uh, first thing we have here in an envelope that I have. Uh, a couple years ago they came out with, uh, I've got a couple envelopes of this stuff lying around. A couple years ago they came out with a uh, collector's edition of stamps. Got the Calvin and Hobbes stamps, uh, you know, Archie and Garfield and Dennis, Beetle Bailey. Then I got the Marvel, the DC stamps. I got the Marvel stamps around here somewhere. Uh, these are this collectible stamps. Came out. This came out, I don't know, maybe two, three years ago. Okay. And then I got this for a dream. This is Innovation Comics, and they did a. Uh, Looks like John Constantine on the cover. They did an adaption of the Vampire Lestat. Lestat. And this is actually not bad. It's it's really a literal, um, literal um, interpretation of the book. Uh, Ronan. I got this from a book club years ago. Eighty-seven cents. Six Gun. Odd Fellows Thoughts sent a lot of those out, which is very cool. Very cool. And uh, I remember finding these at a books a million. I paid maybe three bucks a piece. Well, for this one, Annihilation Conquest, book two. 
Uh, this is actually really good, really good. A lot of different characters in there, and uh, Ultron in space ended up being the bad guy. Uh, got my Marvel Zombies, which I wished I'd taken to have Arthur Pseudonym sign. I got a bunch of his stuff signed. He did the cover. And then up here, I have tons of the Marvel Zombies stuff uh, signed by Pseudonym in red ink there. You know, this is Marvel Zombies versus you know, um, Army of Darkness. It's where they crossed over with Ash and uh, of uh, Army of Darkness, of course. We'll go through all those. Uh, Batman Rest in Peace. No idea where I got this, but I want to say it was probably a uh, Barnes & Noble Books A Million sale or something. I just basically cut the sides out so I can slip it back in the original plastic. Brent Morrison's killed Batman off there. Um, of course, I've showed these off. These were the Incredible Hulk, uh, George Perez, Peter David, uh, Future Imperfect. And then I could not believe I found this. This is one of those things I didn't even know was out there. I've been trying to c uh, collect all of this, um, all of the appearances of Jarella. With uh, she's a Harlan Ellison created character uh, in the microverse of Marvel. And, uh, it's just a world where uh, it's kind of savage. There's magic about, and everybody has green skin like the Hulk and stuff. And then I found this, and I could not believe it. This is the entire uh, collection of those first appearances. Uh, Harlan Ellison's uh, story in there um, is just amazing uh, for that one issue he did. Roy Thomas is on it, Archie Goodwin, Lynn Wine, Bill Manlow, Herb Crimp, Gillis, uh, Sal Bishima, Joe Statton came in there. Just great stuff. Um, like again, I had this, uh, Wolverine Weapon X. This is from the 12-part uh, stories in the anthology, anthology series that came out in, I think it was the late 80s, early 90s, where Barry Winsler Smith came in and gave the origin of how Wolverine got his animatium. And this is the collected edition of those stories. You know, he didn't have a lot of pages. And then I think for part 12 or something, the last part, maybe it's a 10 part story, I don't remember. But the last part they gave Barry Winsler Smith the whole book, if I remember right. You know, um, I had those originals and sold them. Alright, we'll just get a big chunk here. War on Frogs by PPRD. And they gave Herb Tripp some work in here, bless their hearts. Got the uh, Superman Aliens uh, series. Uh, it was a mini series by, between DC and Dark Horse, and I thought it was god awful. Dan Jurgens wrote it, but thank God Kevin Nealon was on it. His, his work on here saved the book, it made it nice to look at. You know. Uh, and then right beside of that we have Batman Predator written by Dave Gibbons and the Hubert Brothers were on it and Dave Gibbons wrote a hell of a story this is really good which cracked me up you know when you consider that's how good it should have been to begin with I think this came out they got a they had a part two of this they started throwing in more of Batman's cast I got the uh, they have the complete Grant Morrison I had the JLA Wildcats by Howard Porter Getting us some more good stuff here. All right, collected edition of History of the DC Universe. I have a. T this was a two-part story that came out in uh, graphic novel form, um, a higher format. Oh my goodness, Baxter! I can't remember what it's called. Anyway, but uh, it was just the retelling of uh, the DC Universe's history after Crisis on the Infinite Earth that came out. George Perez did some spectacular art on it. It was two parts. And they came out with the collected edition, and of course, since it had an Alex Ross cover, I had to get it. So, you know, yay. Alright. Red Sun. This is signed by Dave Johnson. This was Mark Miller's tale of Superman. If uh, if he had left Krypton like 12 hours later or sooner, and he would have let, instead of landing in America, he landed in USSR. And that's an amazing story. Golden Age, one of the... I'd put this in the top five greatest sto comic stories ever, I think. It had definitely has the number one fight scene, in my opinion, with the climax of it. James Robinson's debut, when he just showed his love of those Golden Age characters. Uh, we get into the Darwin Cook stuff. I have a complete set of these, but anyway, this was the one shot that followed uh, the New Frontier, and it actually has some extra pages in it, uh, Batman and Superman fighting each other. And the New Frontier could actually follow the Golden Age, even though the Golden Age was considered an uh, Elseworld tale, and, but they did draw from it. But uh, New Frontier is the telling of, the, uh, of uh, a Silver Age story, kind of the closing of uh, you know, 
takes place during the 50s. It's a period piece. It's just amazing. Uh, one and two. And I actually got one of these off of Amazon, which made me kind of... I'm just not doing well in this video. It's all reversed. But anyway, I got one of these off of Amazon for like a dollar. And I wasn't expecting too much, but it turned out it was a library copy, which it's all right. Got our Death of Batman. Yeah, Complete Kiss. The two Kiss comics that came out in Marvel, uh, recolored. Looks uh, fantastic. Uh, my Vampirella, a Scarlet Thirst with a Dave Stevens cover. Alrighty, what else do we have here? Yeah, we're doing well. Open Space. Uh, there's something about this book, but I can't think of it right now. Great sci-fi tales from M Graphics. This is number one. It's from 1989. Just some great stuff in here. Uh, I know there's something special about it, but I'm not remembering. Now, I had a friend I used to work with, and she and her husband went to England to see his family. And while they were there, they were touring some parts of Europe, and they ended up in France. And she was looking for some comic books for me. She brought everybody something back. And when she got to France, she said that she, you know, almost didn't find the comic book. She almost walked past them because everybody there who were reading these graphic novels were in business suits and had black trench coats on and stuff like that. It was nothing but men reading them. And I was just kind of like, yeah, you know, growing up to read comic books. And I have tried to, uh, <laughs> I have tried to uh, reinterpret this, but this is a great comic because, like all great comics, you should be able to follow the story with the art. I have no idea what they're saying. I placed a few words. I tried to decipher the, um, you know, translate the title. Uh, I think this is the creator Tardy. I mean, I have no idea, but I mean, this is just a great. It feels like so film noir just look, reading it. Clowns and dreaming about clowns. Now this is a, a awesome, just amazing story. Top nine, the 49ers. This is where this was top nine, top ten, the 49ers. Uh, with America's Best Comics, Alan Moore started a line of comics that went back to like the roots of comics, you know, pulp and all out superheroes. And this this series took place in in uh, the city of it took place in modern day when it came out, and they always kind of referenced how you know the city, the 49ers made the city. And everybody had superpowers, and you had to be a cop. And this felt like uh, this felt like uh, Hill Street Blues and Law and Order, you know, meets superheroes. And uh, a lot of people try to compare it to Astro City, but it's a completely different beast. And this, you find out that after World War II, all people with superpowers were forced to go to this city, and they had to follow laws. And these are the cops. And this is when uh, the, you know you're seeing. The, how the town, the city was made and how all the superheroes got there and how people had to adjust and it's kind of got like a love story in it. Alan Moore just did phenomenal on it. One of his underrated things. Speaking of Alan Moore, we got League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, 1910. This is when he, he broke away from uh, DC after Wildstorm had been bought because he was publishing after Wild, Wildstorm. Uh, 1969, the stories got there, they were very thick. Uh, came out 2009, end of the century. Takes a crack at Harry Potter. These are different, but I like them. They're very different from the uh, Wild Star League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Uh, a lot more figuring out to do. What we got here? All right. Superman in the Legion of Superheroes. This this came out after Superman Origins, where Jeff Johns took his crack in a miniseries retelling the origin of Superman. I think it was uh, after Infinite Crisis, maybe. And they reestablished that he was Superboy for a while, and he did have the Legion. And this is just phenomenal. I wish they had kept going with the Legion with what he did in here. Oh, it was so good. Um, I got these. These were on sale at a, a shop I used to go to. I think I got them 75% off. This is a Sinestro Core War, where the seeds of Black Kiss Night were being made. Uh, volumes 1 and 2 the complete uh, Sinestro War series. Uh, and the Black Dossier. This is the hardback. I'm not going to knock every book. We'll be here all night. And this was uh, Alan Moore and Kevin O'Neill. This is this is the beginning of them doing the work away from DC and Wildstorm. This thing is amazing. A bunch of short stories, a lot of, a lot of prose. It even has a 3D section, I think. So that's good stuff. Where was I here? All right, and then we get into some more hardbacks. 
Uh, sadly, a store in the 90s was going out of business, and I think I got this for 80% off. This is the hardback of Frank Miller's first Sin City story that was in Dark Horse Presents before it was called The Hard Goodbye. It didn't get named until the movie came out, and originally it was 25 bucks. so whatever 80% off was is what I got it for. Uh, continuing here, A Dame to Kill For, and uh, you know, A Tale from Sin City, kind of a prequel to the original one. Uh, the Amazing Savage Dragon, the Savage World Trade. Uh, this is where Eric Larson all of a sudden changed things in the book due to a time travel story or something, and the whole world turned into be commandy like. This was like a love letter to uh, Kirby's commandy books. And then The Goon. This is signed by Eric Powell. Uh, Chinatown. This ain't funny. This is just an amazing, amazing story. And I was talking to Eric Powell, and I told him, you know, some of this, something about some of this parts in this story helped me through my divorce. And he said that he was just like, man, he was like, I hear that all the time about that. So, you know, some heavy stuff in there, man. This is really a good, great read. Uh, some more Goon trades. I've got most of the Goon stuff, but I don't have the uh, original stuff before they were with, um, uh, with uh, Dark Horse. And that's in some rough stuff. This is when he was at other publishers before he went to Dark Horse. And it's really cool to see how the goon kind of evolved. Um, my Murder's Childhood. Uh, nothing But Misery. These are so, so good. EC Comics meets like Little Rascals, meets Three Stooges, meets Exorcist. I mean, it's just great stuff. Great Depression. Oh. Yeah, and then when he took a uh, kind of a break, he came out with a miniseries called Groon Noir and had all these people come out there to work on the goon and tell like little stories and stuff, man. You know, Eric Powell was involved, uh, Hilary Barta, Guy Davis, uh, Tony Moore, Steve Niles, Kevin Nolan, Patton Oswalt, if you know who that is, uh, Mike Plug, uh, Herberto Ramos, for you guys that like him, Ryan Souk, you know, all kinds of people. All right, and of course, you know, I've got my Walking Dead volumes one and two. Yes, that's all I have. Um, I used to have a, you know, I used to follow the book, had a lot of issues and stuff. I really need to start getting some more of the trades. But uh, for you guys that don't follow the trades, all the books connect, and volume three would, you know, connect right here where my thumb is at, and, it, and that's how all the trades do. All the trades connect for the covers. Great stuff. This is one of my top 10 comics of all time because of the storytelling, Bone Number 16. Great. Bone Christmas special from uh, Hero Magazine. They say it's rare. I don't know. I have probably some more Bone here. Oh, yeah, all my Bone books. Yeah, I got the Bone Source book from Image. Uh, yeah. And uh, something, from Im something else from Image. Yeah. Got the... Ace Wizard Ace Edition. Um, this is from Wizard 16. This is a retelling of Bone. I don't know what issue, but it's got the uh, like a animation cell cover. It's great stuff. Bone is a lot of fun. Lot of fun. Oh, and there's something else in here. Yeah, I got the Ashcan book from Cartoon Press. No idea if that's worth any money. Let's set those down. And of course. Uh, I am a person who enjoyed, this is from Scholastic, and this is in kids' sections, in, uh, and these are really cheap, I think they're like 9 or 10 bucks a piece. This is the entire retelling of Bone, um, how many volumes was there? In 9 volumes, so I'll some behind, yeah, in 9 volumes, and they came out with Rose, and there's like maybe two more after this and stuff, but uh, it's the entire telling of Rose, and the colors inside are amazing, they're just amazing. A lot of people like their bone in uh, black and white. There's nothing wrong with that. Bone is Carl Barks and Pogo in Lord of the Rings. Uh, just great stuff. So much fun to read. Here's where I think the book took a dark turn and never recovered. When they got into, uh, they met Rockjaw, the gigantic mountain lion. That's where I don't think they recovered. I think the series spent a whole, uh, they spent way too much time up there with him. And I don't think they ever recovered. And he was finishing off the story. Some more Bone the Dragon Slayer. That's a great one. Whoops. Yes, I keep my trades bag. And the Great Cow Race. If there was ever a book that this is where it broke the book and got noticed, I think it was the Great Cow Race. This is so, 
freaking funny. Oh my god. It's like Disney and Tex Avery and uh, uh, I'm trying to think of Abbott Costello maybe. I don't know. This great stuff. And out from Boneville where it all started with the dragons. Great, great stuff. And then we get to my boys collection. I'm missing, I gotta catch up, man. I've got the first seven trays. I don't have number three because I had those in actual issues. I'm dying down here. This is uncomfortable. But anyway, we have, uh, I'm just gonna go backwards here. Volume seven, if you have not read The Boys by Garth Ennis, you know, I don't know what's wrong with you. Number six, Self Preservation Society. Uh, we gotta go now. This is uh, the X Men story, the G Men, I think is what they're called. I mean, it really warps a lot of our superheroes. Garth Ennis is not like superheroes, and this is a special secret black ops group who uh, <laughs> are doing terrible things to heroes because they deserve it. You find out they're perverts and uh, just very not very nice people, and it's really adult stuff. So, and then for you post-apocalyptic fans, there's some great Garth Ennis. This is actually two miniseries that were four issues apiece, Just a Pilgrim, the complete Just a Pilgrim. I probably think this, it's under Dynamite, but Wizard, uh, one of the guys that was publishing Wizard or something, started his own comic book line. It didn't really go far. And then it was taken in Dynamite, put it in the hardback. And it's, Just a Pilgrim is just great stuff. All right, I don't know if I'm going to get all these out, but these are all my preachers. I need to, you know, get them. I got one, two, three, five, six, and nine. So I'm missing four, seven, and eight. I really need to get on the ball and get all this. I've read all the preachers. I've had number one, two, three times. I've had scattered issues. I think I had like a 45 issue run. So you know, I've read them all, and I just kind of prefer them in uh, in uh, you know trades. These are soft cover. I get them for nothing off of Amazon every now and then as they pop up. War in the Sun is fantastic. Uh, Dixie Fried was good. Let me hold them up here. Okay, proud Americans, but there it is. Until the end of the world, one of the top five best stories ever told in comics. Until the end of the world. Holy shit. Wow. And, you know, we're all began gone to Texas. And, you know, I really don't know if I ever want them to really make that into a TV show or a movie because there's been talk. And then we have... The Invisibles. I've got the first three volumes. I need to get the rest of them. I haven't read the last one. But this is uh, infamous because this is the one where it's like the most personal story Grant Morrison did. He was supposedly taking drugs while he was writing and it affected his life and where things happened. Ultimate conspiracy theory. And The Matrix supposedly ripped it off. The movie The Matrix. He was pretty mad. And when you consider it, Warner Brothers owns DC. This came out through Vertigo. And uh, The Matrix was a Warner Brothers movie. It's not too far out there, you know. But, you know, here's the first three volumes. Great stuff. Good, good fun reads. And I was glad when Phil Jimenez came on to uh, do the art. He said every series was supposed to be, like, a different atmosphere, different mood uh, for the story. So he always, in his mind, imagined there would always be different artists than there were and stuff. But, you know, with his Ana Doom Patrol stuff and Animal Man Patrol stuff, those guys could tell great stories. But they weren't the best artists, and then the covers always had like Brian Bolin on them, which you know, you know, gave the book a little credibility art-wise. But those guys told great stories, you know. So I was glad to see they gave him somebody, you know, a little more up there. And uh, okay, I don't know if this is rare or not. I've heard people have problems finding it. Sandman, Sandman uh, Midnight Theater. This is when you had the Sand, Sandman book coming out through Vertigo. The one by Neil Gaiman, then he had Sandman Mystery Theater, like this says here, or something like that, Midnight Theater. And that was, come, that was by Matt Wagner, and I want to say Guy Davis or something. But this crossed over those characters. Matt Wagner and Neil Gaiman uh, came on here, and they crossed over Neil Gaiman's Sandman with DC's Vertigo Sandman, which this was actually a pretty good story, you know. It ties in with issue one of Sandman very well, very well. Okay, and then we have the trades of Sandman. I was doing a podcast with Constant Bromstar when we had our finally designed show, and he brought out his trades. He bought all ten of the trades in like a set or something, and I had my original trades. These are first print trades, which I kind of prefer because they don't have numbers on them. All the new trades have numbers across the top of them, but I kind of like them like this. And the coloring is so much better in the new ones that have come out, but I'm, I'm still happy to have some of the first ones. And uh, when I remember it, okay, 
this is Preludes and Nocturnes. This is like the first eight issues of Sandman, and it reprints uh, the first appearance of Death. So you get to the second one, The Doll's House, and it starts out with that issue, the first appearance of Death. Okay. What happened was is that this was the first Sandman trade to come out. I think this is a first print, the first soft cover trade to come out. And then they backed up and they did Preludes and Nocturnes and came out with all of these. So there's The Doll's House. That's volume two. And I actually prefer the covers on these. These are Dave McKean covers. Seasons of the Mist. That's when I was, that's what made me a fanatical Sandman fan. Until then, I was a casual reader and appreciated it and was like, oh, that's cool. I could keep up a conversation. Then I read Seasons of the Mist. Ugh, never, nothing ever changed. Okay, Death. Uh, what is this? Oh, my goodness. The Cost of Living. This is Chris Batchelow work, and that's Tori Amos on the cover as Death. She's a huge uh, the gaming fan. Of course, let's like I said, Preludes and Nocturne, Nocturnes. Great Sam Keith art in there. Brief Lives, underrated story, really good. I mean, they're all critically acclaimed, but when it comes to Sandman stories, people talk about different ones. Uh, what do we got here? A Game of You, very interesting story. Fables and Reflections. Dream Country, I think I've seen this everywhere, and this is kind of like a Peter Franklin record from the 70s. I think everybody had this one. Okay. And I think I'm like 10 issues for having the entire run of the Sandman actual comics. So that's kind of cool to have. And of course, we're getting down there to the nitty gritty. Got the, I have all but two. I think I need issue 26 and 28 of the Saga of the Swamp thing with Alan Moore. But here's the first two soft cover traits that came out years ago, and then they just stopped. Um, Love and Death. I don't think this has issue 20, which was Alan Moore's first appearance, but the first issue that he wrote. But uh, it starts out with issue 21, The Anatomy Lesson, which I still need to do a preview for. But they have great art artwork in these little, little, uh, you know, in the forwards, little watercolor work and stuff. It sets the mood before you even get in the book. And actually, I think that's issue 64 on the cover, where Alan Moore's last issue, and they put it on the uh, they put it on the uh, second volume of the soft cover trades. So those are excellent. And I found all of the I think I got all these V for Vendetta issues for I made a deal where I think I got all ten of them for something like three bucks or something at a yard sale a couple years ago. But before that, I did have the trade that finally came out, uh, re-released when the movie was coming out, and wow, you know. I had chances to get those beasts from Vendetta back in the 80s and early 90s uh, with Watchmen. They used to be in dollar boxes, but I thought, in my mind, a maxi series was 12 issues, and I always found 10, and I could not open my mind to the fact that, well, maybe they just made 10. I never heard of that before. It's either, back then, it was either four issues, six issues, or 12. And there was only 10 made, so, you know, I don't know how many times I passed those up. Then we got a hardback of Earth 2 by Grant Morrison came out in the early 2000s. Grant Morrison and Frank Quietly reintroducing the Crime Syndicate, which just, this thing is phenomenal. Oh, this is so good. So good. Go get it. Go get it. It's Earth 3. Uh, well, it was Earth 2 because, you know, thanks to Cross and Infinite Earth, there was no more multiple Earths, so they called it Earth 2. But these were the Earth 3 uh, reinterpretations of the Crime Syndicate that started in the Golden Age. And they only have, at that this time, they only had a handful of appearances, and of course, with Fury Reveal going on. All right, well, that's almost a 30 minute video, so I'm going to stop there on the top shelf. If you want to see what's on the bottom shelf, there's three times more because this is all the trades and paperbacks. And down here, there's a few trades, and it comes up to individual issues and stuff. And on the, uh, and I've got two more shelves here. One down here at the bottom and one over there. So if you guys like this and want to see more, let me know. I mean, this was actually requested by three or four people. And, uh, you know, that was actually kind of fun. All right. I can actually set up better next time. Let me know if you want to see the other ones, man. I'm not going to do them if they're not requested.